back around, uh, I don't know when it was, uh, around the turn of the century, um, Teddy Roosevelt uh, uh, um, decided he'd run for public office. And at this time, all the public office in, in, in New York State was dominated by machine politics of uh, very corrupt and crude machine politics. And he's uh, patrician and uh, decides he's going to run for office and kind of shocked everybody in the social register that he would do such a crude thing and people say to him, you know, none of our friends would consider running for office. And he says, well, then none of your friends are members of the ruling class. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, uh, so join the ruling class. Um, the, the uh, you know, but write your own books, science fiction or otherwise. Uh, who knows, maybe you'll write the screenplay that one of these guys will pick up on and, and turn into a movie that, uh, you know, there really hasn't been a movie, a, a genuine science fiction movie about the first human mission to Mars. Um, they, you know, they're, they're really, uh, well, uh, there, there hasn't been, I mean, you know, uh, total recalls to shoot them up. Uh, the, you know, uh, <laughs> well, Mission to Mars is King Solomon's Mines redone. Um, the, uh, the, the, the other one was even worse. Was and, um, the, you know, a lot of them are fundamentally uh, haunted house movies. You know, the teenagers go to the haunted house, they hear a scream, and the leader says, okay, let's split up. And, um, Okay, and then one by one they get killed. You know, it's kind of how it's done. Um, th there hasn't been a movie that really presents the great adventure of, you know, whether it's the Shackleton adventure or the Frontier adventure, in any in any realistic sense. You know, I first landing, uh, uh, Doug Wick wanted to do it as a movie, but he took it up at the line at the Sony, and it got to an executive vice president, and he said, "Can't do it. It's got to have monsters in it." Um, or at least Nazis, and the, the, the um, you know, so, I mean, that would be great. Um, but uh, use your creative talent, use your, art oh, Capricorn One, yeah, there you go. Um, okay, uh, that, that, and. That was the first mission to Mars, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> Press unit had O.J. Simpson right uh, for the law. That's okay, right. um, <laughs> yeah. anyway, uh, but look, use your creativity whether it's through entering politics, or writing your own literature, or writing your screenplay, or writing op-eds in the newspaper. Use the power of the pen, use the power of ideas. Is this mic alive? Is this mic alive? Yeah. Okay. In terms of science fiction, I think well, the way to support Mars is just to write science fiction that points out that Mars is real, it's a real place. It's not a place of the imagination. It's not something somebody made up. It is a planet that is in its way as real and as beautiful and as wonderful as all of the places on Earth. And I think just, you know, writing science fiction that pays attention to that and emphasizes that is important. Another thing is Mars exploration is not going to be easy. And I think writing fiction that reminds people that it isn't easy. It isn't, oh, two kids get together in their garage and build a spaceship, although I read that story. Uh, the two kids built a spaceship with the anti-gravity theory that one of them came up with, uh, you know, dozing off in his algebra class in high school. Uh, <laughs> I think another flaw in a lot of science fiction is magical technology just inventing a, a technology that just solves all the problems and makes everything, everything too easy. Another thing that I paid attention to when I wrote my no Mars novel, it did seem to me, just reading other people's Mars novels, that they all ended with one of two endings. The first ending is, oh, they discover life on Mars, and this is the ending of the story. And the other story is, oh, they discover alien artifacts on Mars. It's amazing how many alien artifacts happen to be sitting right out on the surface of Mars. Why they put the alien artifacts on Mars instead of on the Earth uh, was surprising. And then there's one that combines the two, where they actually discover living aliens on Mars. 
uh, sometimes on Mars because they came there from another solar system and are just waiting for us on Mars instead of, uh, instead of coming the last few miles to Earth. So in fact, I had resolved to write a, a Mars novel that didn't rely on any of these. The ending isn't 2001 where we discover great alien artifacts and it was in a novel where what was beautiful and wonderful about it was Mars the way it really is. And I think there's a lot to that. I think we should in some extent, as much as we can, write science fiction that really is about the real world, uh, about worlds that we could go to and things that we could see and things that might be out there and not just novels that are, you know, wonderful, exciting shoot 'em ups as people run around and have great adventures shooting at each other and it happens to be set on a, a place of your own imagination that every now and then you say, oh yes, this is Mars. But that doesn't do justice to Mars. Mars is a real place and we should talk about Mars and write about Mars uh, with that reality in mind. Yeah, pretty much what they said. Um, <laughs> one thing, one thing that I can think of, if you're, you know, if you are, if you are a writer, then obviously you can write about Mars, and you don't have to be a fiction writer. You can write, you can write nonfiction, you can write essays, you can write for your local community paper, you can write for the newsletter at your school or at your place of work. Um, share what you know. Everybody in this room knows stuff about Mars that most of the people around them do not know. If you are interested in Mars, if you're excited about Mars, and if you're here, you almost certainly are then share that interest and enthusiasm and excitement. Don't be afraid to talk to people about Mars. I was, having, I was having lunch the other day with a couple of science fiction writers of my acquaintance. And understand when I say science fiction, it's a very broad term that includes science fiction and fantasy. And one of my best friends, a person I know is not dumb, said to me as we were discussing the, the plot of the piece I was working on, I said, why do you have to wear a space suit on Mars anyway? Why can't you just wear an oxygen mask? Mm. And I had to stop and think and go back to first principles and remember, you know, well, think about what would happen if you just put your arm in a vacuum chamber. And so I was able to explain to her why you need a space suit on Mars, and she might even remember it next time. And so people <laughs> will listen if their friends talk to them about things that they care about. And so as a reader, as a person who's enthusiastic about space travel, you can make a difference by being open with your friends about your interests and talking to them about the things that you care about and share with them the things that you know. Um, I, was, uh, I was involved in a project to create an, uh, an open free science fiction anthology based on astronomy principles. It's called Diamonds in the Sky. It's available free online and it contains about a dozen stories, each of which is a science fiction story with real plot and real characters which nonetheless illuminates an astronomical principle like why do we have seasons or just how big is the universe anyway. Um, and I haven't seen a lot of reviews of it, but the principle is sound. And I think if more people did that sort of thing and helped to spread the word about that sort of thing, I think it would help to get people more interested in science, astronomy, and Mars specifically. I want to add something too. If you've got children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, young people in your life in general, as David and the rest of the panel said, sh share what you know and get them enthusiastic now. Because by the time they get to 18, 19, 20, and they're only interested in the opposite sex and what they're going to do when they get home, whether, what video game they're going to play or whatever, it's too late. So, you know, we need to encourage children to be interested in Mars. And that's why the first Mars conference I came to, I bought posters for my grandkids that still have them on their walls. Fantastic. Okay, next question. What is the best Mars science fiction, in your opinion, and name what it is and explain why it's the best? Do I have to pick one? Yeah, but not your own work. Right. <laughs> and that applies to all of you. Well, I'm going to, I'm, I, I'm going to put in a word for, for um, Jeff's Mars Crossing, which, which is just brilliant. But I have to say that probably the best 
and I'm going to say not only highest in literary quality, but also most influential work about Mars in the past 30 years has got to be Walter John Williams' trilogy of red, blue, and red, green, and blue Mars, because that. Thank you, Kim Stanley Robinson. My mistake. Um, the um, the thing about these books is they combine they combine a pretty well worked out vision of the terraforming of Mars with interpersonal and political politics that make it really a, it's a, it's a generation saga. It's a, it's an enormous soap opera with long lived characters that you really get to know over the course of it. It looks a lot at the question of what is a revolution and what do people fight over and why. And it looks into the value and and the influence of personal opinion and and who who's sleeping with whom and how these things affect much bigger things. So many many things happen just because people are angry at each other and not because it's technically the right thing or the wrong thing to do. And I think that Red, Green, and Blue Mars take that into account to make a stirring story without breaking the science too badly. And it's also been terrifically influential both on the science field in terms of the number of people who've used it as an example and gotten excited about Mars because of it, and in the science fiction field because of the number of people who've read it and, and admired it. Well, I have to say I liked Red Mars, but I was bored enough by Green Mars that I didn't bother with Blue Mars. <laughs> I like the novella, the short version of Green Mars, uh, a story about climbing Olympus Mons. If I were recommending Kim Stanley Robinson, I'd go probably for his more obscure early Mars novel, Icehenge, which I thought was a, a much more quirky and interesting novel. But I think if I were recommending a story, uh, I would go with a John Varley story called In the Hall of the Martian Kings. Uh, not one of Varley. Varley was a, a writer that very much impressed me when I was, you know, in kind of college age and uh, subject to being greatly impressed. Uh, in the Hall of the Martian Kings is not one of his best known uh, stories, but it is a story about Martian colonization. In fact, it's a story about a, a group of astronauts that become stranded on Mars. And, have to learn how to colonize Mars because they have discovered that they're not, uh, <laughs> their ride home is not going to be arriving and, and may not arrive for a long time, if ever. So I think, uh, I think I would go with that. I'm also impressed, of course, with, very much with Larry Nevin, and I like his, his Mars stories, although he didn't write very many Mars stories. He wrote, uh, I think, two at the bottom of the hole and uh, How Heroes Die. But, but I'll go with John Varley. Okay. Uh, actually, I had the same impression of Robinson's books as, as uh, Jeff did. Um, uh, I, I liked Red Mars. Uh, Green Mars was tough sledding, and I wouldn't read Blue Mars. Uh, it got too weird. Uh, but the uh, actually, I think the most influential Mars. Well, I mean, I, War of the Worlds is obviously very influential, and, and, and the Edgar Rice Burroughs is very influential. But the, the I think uh, Heinlein's young adult work um, is probably the most influential body of science fiction uh, and uh, in terms of actually changing people's lives and, and, and uh, putting them on a certain track. And uh, let's see, he had a couple that had to do with Mars. One was Red Planet and another, I forget, but it was also, what? Well, Pod Kane certainly. The Rolling Stones, yeah. The Rolling Stones and, and, and the, 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 you know, they're all once again um, about self-reliance and um, liberty and, um, and the great adventure that is just around the corner and you can be part of it if you develop your mind. Um, and, and by the way, that's the sense in which science fiction teaches science, not the